Today is entitled Lessons from a Great Love Story. It's a story found in Genesis, and it's a story about a family and a dynamic that began to play out in this family. I'm going to read you the story. It's in Genesis 29 from verse 14. You can follow if you want, but you don't really need to. It's a love story, so you can maybe just listen. And I'm reading from the Living Bible as well, so it's a, a little different. The story about Jacob. And Jacob was busy working for his uncle. His uncle's name was Laban. And we're reading from about verse 14. And after Jacob had been there for about a month, Laban said to him one day, just because we are relatives is no reason for you to work for me without pay. And it goes on in verse 16, it says, now Laban had two daughters, Leah the older and her younger sister Rachel. Verse 17, now Leah had lovely eyes, <laughs> lovely eyes. There's nothing quite like lovely eyes. My wife had the loveliest eyes. She had these large golden eyes that when she looked at me, the answer was yes. <laughs> Leah had lovely eyes. Let's leave it there. But Rachel was shapely. Mm. She was shapely. Look at these people, how embarrassed they are here. <laughs> they never thought they'd heard this in, hear this in church. It's worse in some places in the Bible, just let me warn you. It says here, that Rachel was shapely and in every way a beauty. Verse 18, Jacob was in love with Rachel. What a thing to be able to love and be loved. What a thing. There's nothing like it. Jacob was in love with Rachel. So he told her father, 
I will work for you. Now he's volunteering here. I will work for you for seven years if you'll give me Rachel as my wife. Seven years. I mean, you know, in, in those days, you only lived to about 30, 35 at worst. Seven years. I mean, are you crazy? Seven years. Oh, my goodness. And he says, I'll work for seven years if you'll give me Rachel as my wife. Agreed, Laban replied. I'd rather give her to you than to someone outside the family. Notice there a bit of a agenda. Verse 20, so Jacob spent the next seven years working to pay for Rachel. But they seemed to him but a few days, for he was so much in love. Isn't that amazing when you're in love? It's just like time just, it passes. And I'm not talking about that one month between when you meet someone and you think you must marry them. I'm talking just about loving you. It goes quickly. It seemed like it was just a few days, and finally the time came for him to marry her. Isn't this a beautiful love story? I have fulfilled my contract, Jacob said to his uncle Laban, now give me my wife. So Laban invited all the men in the settlement to celebrate with Jacob at a big party, and afterwards that night when it was dark, Laban took Leah to Jacob. And in the morning, he screamed, it was Leah. What sort of trick is this? Jacob raged at Laban. I worked for seven years for Rachel. What do you mean by this trickery? He said, but it's not our custom to marry off the younger daughter ahead of her sister. Laban replied smoothly. Wait until the bridal week is over and you can have Rachel's. Two, if you promise to work for me for another seven years. This love story is getting a little bit. And Jacob agreed to work seven more years. And then Laban gave him Rachel too. It's an amazing love story. It has everything that you need in a love story. It has intrigue, it has deception, it has heartbreak, it has tragedy, it has breakthrough, it has a perseverance, it has prayers, it has answers to prayers, it has triumph. Ultimately, it has great destiny. The story actually goes on, and it doesn't actually just end there if you want to go and read the whole story. It's, it's, it's quite intriguing that Leah was blessed with the ability to just have children and have children and have children. And Rachel was barren. And the Bible actually points out why she was barren, because of the ugliness towards Leah. The Living Bible uses the word slighted. When I was a kid, we used to speak about you were dissing me. Has everybody, anybody heard that term? Perhaps they were dissing Leah a bit because she wasn't the first choice, you know. And God allowed this to happen. So it's an interesting thing. Be careful how you treat people. God takes notice, even if they're wrong. Because she must have connived with her father. So be, be very careful how you treat people. And so this whole thing, this whole beautiful love story and in the end, God brings it out, and I'm going to wrap that up at the end of the sermon in, in such a beautiful way just to see how God just takes this and makes, it, makes an amazing story out of it. And God used it. Lessons from a great love story. Point number one, all good things are worth the wait and the work. Any good thing you want in life is worth the wait and the work. And it's the two, thing, two things people don't want to do. They don't want to work for it, and they don't want to wait for it. That's the bottom line of corruption. I don't want to work for it, and I don't want to wait for it. I want it now. I want it in a hand, Gucci handbag, preferably, <laughs> in $200 bills or 200 grand bills for whatever it is. I want it now. But you see, I'm telling you, if all good things that are, are worth anything 
are worth the wait and worth the work. And he worked for seven years. He waited for seven years and he worked another seven years and he waited another seven years and he got the good thing. Don't be afraid today if you may be studying for your degree and you think, nah, man, this is just too much. It's, it, it's just too demanding. No, 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 no. The good thing will be worth the wait and the work. Maybe you're working on your marriage at the moment. Things are a bit rough. I want to encourage you. Keep on working on it. Keep on waiting. Keep on seeing it through. It will be worth it. All good things in life are worth the wait and the work. Don't be discouraged. Come on. Maybe even in your business, in your career, wherever it might, might be, the good things are worth the wait and worth the work. So go for it. Don't be discouraged. The second lesson from this great love story is, is a, bit of a, a bit of a hard one. And that is that you will reap what you've sown so, so well. You will reap what you've sown. Now, now how do you... How do I get that out of the story? Well, in a strange twist, just as Laban and his daughter Leah had conspired against Jacob in this deception, many years earlier, Jacob, together with his mother, had conspired with their father Isaac to do Esau out of his inheritance. And here it happens again. Now, if there's anything I've seen in, in the work of the ministry, if there's anything I've watched over time, is that people will reap what they've sown. It's, it's almost to me the most scariest thing about the ministry and working in people's lives. Because die will dry. What goes around comes around. It all comes out in the wash. And at the end, you will reap what you've sown. So, so well. Sometimes when marriages aren't going well, we think, oh, well, maybe I'll just have an affair. Let me have an affair. And we sow. And we think, okay, I'm, you know, at least I'm happy. Man, that thing can come back and bite you in a million ways that you don't even know which way you're looking. And I want to encourage you, be careful how you sow, even as a young person. Sow well. So well in your business, so well in your relationship, so well in your work, so well in your attitude. If you, if you resign from your work, resign well, finish well. If you are fired, finish well. Go and thank them. Go and close, you know, do whatever you need to do, but finish well. So well because you're going to reap, and you want to reap good. So be encouraged that uh, you can sow well. And that's what I see how this played out. And so Jacob gets exactly what he had sown, trickery. And that's the next lesson. The third lesson I see out of this great love story is that not everything in life goes according to plan. Now, isn't that a revelation? <laughs> not everything in life goes according to plan. Not that you had a plan. Some people... You know, you just go through life, and it's not a specific plan, but it, things happen, and, well, that wasn't the plan. And uh, not everything goes according to plan. And I believe if we, can, if we can trust God, that's where, when I was speaking about the fact that I had to, I spoke about the sovereignty of God, and then I had to be tested on it. You see, God is sovereign. God will do whatever He likes. He will not ask your permission. He will do what He wants to do. He saw fit for Vanessa to go and be with Him. So be it. It didn't work out like I'd planned. God is sovereign. 
It's all yours. Not everything will work out according to plan. You see here, Jacob had, had loved Rachel and had worked for him for 14 years. And now, on top of it, she can't have children. And Leah is just producing and producing and producing. <laughs> it just doesn't go according to plan. It looks like all the blessing is there where the trickery was. And here where the genuine love was, this not going according to plan. And often from our perspective, things don't make sense and, and we can get frustrated or even angry. But what intrigues me about Jacob was that he was able to embrace this, this change of season. He was able to embrace it. It intrigues me because when, when his father-in-law came to him and gave the proposal that he works another seven years, it says in verse 28, so Jacob agreed to work seven more years. Somehow he was able to say, it is what it is. I'm going to make it work. He could have got offended, resigned from the family, you know, dumped Leah. I don't know. He could have done a host of things, but he had he, he somehow, just, it is what it is, I'm going to make it work. Quite amazing. So things don't go according to plan. Point number four, I see that the good things and the bad things are all part of life. Sometimes we think the good things are life and the bad things are not life. But the good and the bad, life is not just made up of good things. Everything doesn't just run smoothly, but God remains good, and God remains faithful. And the good and the bad are all part of the rich fabric of life. That's why people at the end of their lives can write memoirs, because there was so much. There was so much that happened. There was, they went through so much. In the end, Rachel dies tragically during childbirth, during her second child. Firstly, God blessed her, and she was able to have two children, Joseph and then Benjamin. Unfortunately, during childbirth, she, she must have suffered, and the child was born. They went to her, and they said to her, it's born, it's a son, she said, call the son Benoni, or Benoni, son of my sorrow, and she died. And uh, then Jacob comes along and he says, no, 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 this is the son of my right hand. He will not be called that, because he's going to be something different. And God sees things differently. My last point is that as we trust God, he will bring about something beautiful in his time. He works all things out for the good. You see, the end result of this complicated love story has two wonderful dimensions. Firstly, Rachel. Rachel had a son by the name of Joseph. And God chose Joseph, raised him up to be the, the savior of the then known world. That boy went on to be the saving grace of his own family, his own nation, and the world as it was known at that stage. He was the one who became a prince in Egypt and was able to save the, the then known world through the gathering of food during the seven years of plenty so that during the seven years of lack there was provision. And Leah, the unloved one, God also took note of her. And he gave her a son by the name of Judah amongst all of he gave her a son by the name of Judah, and out of the line of Judah came Jesus, the Savior of the world, and your Savior, 
your savior came out of this mingle moose. <laughs> and God can take your mingle moose. I don't know what that is in English. God can take, <laughs> he can take it and bring something absolutely beautiful out of it. And that's the thing that excites me. Jacob and Leah never lived to see it. Have you ever thought about the fact that you might be sowing today for something that you may never see? It may be seen in another generation. It may be seen in generations to come. It may be seen when you get to heaven. I don't know. But have you thought about that? Because some of us live in the here and now and we think, you know, this is all there is. There's another whole dimension. Rachel never got to see Joseph being a prince of Egypt and saving her family. But she was part of it. God worked it out. God worked it out beautifully for their good. And you know what? He wants to do the same for you. And I close with this scripture. Let me first say, if Jacob could look back today, I'm sure he would be amazed at what God had done. And we can expect the same. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, and with this I close. I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished. That's the good news for each one of us. That's the lessons from these love stories.